Hello everyone. Good good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Meta MetaMath uh, series of webinar. It's my pleasure today to uh, introduce Professor Massimo Rosen. Uh, he's going to talk about the mechanics and dynamics of two-dimensional quasi-periodic composites. So, Professor Massimo, please. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh... Thank you, Mohamed, and thank you, Sebastian and Bogdan, to, for organizing this event and and uh, and for uh, allowing me to speak in this uh, in this uh, framework. Uh, hopefully, you can hear me okay. Everybody can hear me okay. If you can say yes, good. So this work is um, in collaboration with um, Carlos Marchi and Danilo Belli uh, from San, San, um, from Sao Paulo uh, School of Engineering. And uh, and Matteo Rosa in my in my group at University of Boulder, and it's a little bit of a work in progress that we've been work doing in terms of dynamics and mechanics of quasi periodic two dimensional composites and plates. So there's some things that we're working on, and I just want to share as we have uh, started working in this field. So as a way of introduction, just a really brief introduction about. What is crystals? I think we, we all know what crystals are, and they are defined by periodic arrangements of atoms. And the key thing about the periodicity is that they have translational symmetry. And uh, I think this is something very familiar to all of us. And um, when you have a, a periodic arrangement of atoms or in general in, of inclusions, you can imagine that you could... Uh, uh, perform a Fourier transform of these properties, or you can do X-ray diffraction, which is sort of a physical principle that allows to do the same thing, uh, to basically visualize a geometry in, an, in a reciprocal space. And, uh, and that uh, visualization provides uh, and highlights symmetries, underlying symmetries of the system. And uh, this is an example on this, on this side here of a six-fold symmetric um, lattice, and then you can see the six-fold symmetry in its diffraction uh, pattern. So I like to think in a probably simplistic way of diffraction patterns uh, are essentially physical representation of a Fourier transform conducted in space as a function of the distribution of material. And uh, so this is uh, kind of the basis of what we've been working on in terms of generating these geometries. And as we all know very well, is the periodicity of crystal has driven and inspired significant developments in material science and mechanics in terms of photonic and phononic crystals and the area of metamaterials that um, generally in the broad, for the broad majority of cases, um, assume or employ periodicity of some uh, uh, modulation of properties. So um, we also know that um, you cannot with, maintain uh, but if you want to impose to maintain translation of symmetries in, in, in space, you can only tile a certain, uh, with a certain number of geometries. So the crystallographic restriction theorem uh, restricts the tessellations to uh, two, three, four, or six-fold symmetries in, in, in the plane. And uh, again, if you enforce these uh, translational symmetries, um, which poses restriction on types of tessellation that one can, can do, and also poses restrictions on what kind of geometries one can explore. So we wanted to think about, along with others, to see how we can relax these restrictions and look at different geometries. And uh, so this is well known how, um, again, if you do pentagon tiles, there are, if you assume they're all the same, if you use all the same tiles, then you're going to leave gaps. You cannot tessellate the plane. But um, if, you, if you remove that uh, restrictions, then uh, we know there's a number of tessellations that are possible. And the Penrose uh, tiles types of tessellation allows to uh, tessellate a, a space with, with um, a, a lattice or a set of uh, tiles that enforce fivefold symmetries, for instance. So that goes uh, way beyond that because you can also uh, look at different tessellations. But um, also along these lines, uh, we can look at always as we do in solid state physics and the key advancements there and um, almost 10 years ago, uh, the, the, the Nobel Prize to uh, Shackman with that he, as a result of his studies on um, quasi crystals, which uh, were discovered by looking at the electron diffraction pattern of uh, some uh, naturally occurring materials that um, showed symmetries that violated the restriction theorem. And that led to a lot of controversy, but finally that was resolved in favor of this discovery. 
that led to the Nobel Prize. So by looking at these diffraction patterns, it's a way for us to think about how we can design a, a number of geometries um, and then inspire maybe mechanics and mechanical composites. And so, so as, you, as I mentioned, there's a number of symmetries with different tiles. If you have two types of tiles or three or four or more, then you can, you can tessellate the space with geometries that have uh, rotational symmetries that are five-fold, 11-fold, or seven-fold, or 17-fold, for instance. So we've been wondering, along with others, so we're not certainly the only ones who are looking at these, but we've been wondering what type of mechanical properties a system with these symmetries would have. So we started sort of a, a broad exploration of these. And uh, and as I said, there's a lot of literature in, in here, so I'm trying to go over this very quickly to uh, to overview some of these uh, related work that um, I've looked at um, a number of properties that make these inter these designs very interesting overall. So we looked at uh, you can look at uh, some work by um, uh, Leva and Rexman at Penn State that looked at the uh, enhanced transport in photonic quasi crystals, the discovery of superconductivity, as well and. Um, um, uh, Emil is on the line. He's been looking at uh, uh, quasi-periodic patterns and uh, how they can be described. Their spectral properties can be described by um, a fractal spectrum that uh, is uh, reminiscent of the half-sided butterfly, and, uh, and and investigating very interesting topological properties that are associated with the existence of edge states in these systems. In my group, we also looked at uh, similar systems with uh, consisting of, of, of beams connected by springs and other types of inclusions that are not periodically placed, but they're uh, placed in a in non-commensurate, potentially non-commensurate arrangements. And uh, we undercover uh, butterfly type uh, spectral properties as well in these systems, which seems to be an underlying property of, of all of these configurations. Um, so other that are uh, looking at the topology of these seems to be a very rich area in in terms of the presence of again edge states uh, and localized modes at the edges and defect modes and also um, band gaps in these systems that again are non periodic. So in mechanics, uh, there's been quite a bit of work also and uh, looking at the failure or quasi periodic lattices and I apologize if I'm missing some so I just don't want to go over these, but um, I, I just selected a few. The work by uh, Sigmund, um, Ole Sigmund in Denmark has looked at um, extreme isotropic stiffness, which is uh, one of the areas and one of the metrics that we've been looking at as well. Um, and uh, just very recently also work uh, by uh, uh, um, Sebastian and, and Martin Wegener, they looked at uh, isotropic chiral acoustic phonons in, in 3D quasi crystalline uh, lattices um, that have shown also similar properties in terms of isotropy and bent structure that are quite interesting overall, as well as uh, the presence of large sonic gaps in 12-fold quasi-crystals that have been reported also recently in Journal of Applied Physics. So you see this is a, overall an area that it's quite interesting for me and I think for our community as a whole in terms of um, if you have mechanical systems, what can you get from these and what kind of designs you can explore. So I'd like to walk you through our design approach and how we came about looking at these systems um, in the last couple of years. And, uh, and so the outline of the talk is going to be looking at uh, how do we design these uh, crystalline and quasi-crystalline composites. And we've done some numerical explorations of their mechanical properties in a 2D system under plain strain conditions. And we looked at stiffness and specifically isotropy of these um, and uh, looked, uh, done some studies on wave propagation and band gaps. And then we looked at uh, designing similar structures in a, on a plate substrate. And, uh, and this is really very much work in progress where we're looking at um, investigating the dynamic properties experimentally, and then we have some numerical results, and then I'll wrap it up with some conclusions. Um, so the design of crystal and quasi-crystals that we pursue is based on a assignment of periodicity in, in the reciprocal space. And uh, we haven't invented this. So I, I, one of the key references that we looked at is Don Lubezki's uh, book in, on introduction to quasi-crystals, where he sort of explains the approach that we've adopted. And I uh, explain it briefly here in the next slides. So basically we can assume 
that um, we have a, a function of space, V of R, so where R defines the domain of, of our uh, spatial domain of our structure, and phi may be a physical property, say density or, or, or stiffness or material distribution. So that is the function that defines how the material or, or two materials are distributed or, or, or properties distributed in the space. And basically what we do is uh, you can assign a, a periodicity for these by assigning a, a wave vector uh, Kn and, and assigning also a number of uh, N that defines the symmetry, so of 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 the of the uh, uh, arrangements that results from this. So larger N defines the symmetry order, and then N uh, low N varies from negative N over two and N over two minus one. So you can define how many K N vector you specify, and uh, and obviously the magnitude of them and so on. So. Um, so for example, we can think of uh, the case of a n equals two. So if you look at the, in, in the reciprocal space kx ky, we could define a a, a vector, so a, a an amplitude magnitude of the wave vector defining the periodicity, and we can assign that there are two peaks in this domain um, along the x-axis, basically aligned with the x-axis. So kn has components only along x, and so once we define these, we can define them as delta functions, basically in this space. And then if we design them as delta function, then we could take an inverse Fourier transform that will give us phi of R um, according to this formula up here. So it's not really a, a you can think of a, an inverse Fourier transform, but you can also thinking thinking of just taking this uh, summation over here. That'll give you a distribution phi of R of properties that are, as we, you would expect, it's periodic along the X direction. And uh, and varies continuously as a wave, like a sinusoidal wave along X. And so if we wanna do a, a composite, let's say we can arbitrarily choose to make a, a, impose a threshold on this. So that assign a value equal to, say one value equal to zero and one value equal to one above a certain threshold. And then we get a layered composite. So we get a, a system where the black lines correspond to material A and the white line correspond to material B, and then you have a, a one-dimensional composite as a result of this process. And then we can also take these thresholded phi of R bar uh, and then take an inverse Fourier, tra Fourier transform in space to verify what happens, and as you would expect, yeah, we have a, a two peaks uh, where we had designed it. We have a central peak because we have two materials, so there's a, there's a bias, DC bias, you can call it that way. And so, and so this could be our design analysis, but the interesting thing of this is that this is very general because we can assign an arbitrary number of peaks in this uh, domain and come up with different geometries. So for instance, uh, if you do a N equal four, so something that has a fourfold symmetric, then you get a 2D periodic system with, uh, with symmetry along the X and Y direction. And, and so you end up with this, uh, um, fairly standard, I would say, or well-known 2D composites with, with a square lattice that develops along a square lattice. But again, it is uh, very straightforward to go to case n equals six. So you get um, a, a three-fold or six-fold symmetric one. So these are all periodic and they all satisfy the crystallographic restriction theorem, but there's no such a thing anymore in here if you relax the need for periodicity. So if you go to eight, then you start having these uh, geometries. So what is meant? So in this case, as you can see, if you look on, on this side here, you can see that there's no longer translational periodicity. However, what is kept and what remains is the eightfold symmetry, rotational symmetry. So these are rotational symmetric. You can divide it up in uh, eight wedges um, and then and repeat the structure in an eightfold symmetric fashion. If you look at the uh, 2D FFT of this black and white distribution, which is done here, you can recognize the similarity to the quasi-crystal diffraction patterns that you can see. So you have, we have the eight peaks that were assigned in our design, and then you have other peaks because of the thresholding and the fact that there's a DC bias and so on. So you basically get a, we get a diffraction pattern of these systems. So hopefully 
the design approach is quite is clear, hopefully, and it's fairly easy to implement and uh, actually very easy to implement. And um, and so I just walked through all the possibilities. So N equals 10, now you can imagine you can go as uh, as crazy as you want, <laughs> basically in these systems and uh, and create very, very interesting patterns that um, that you could assign them different properties and, and so on. So um, and go up to N equals 14. So and uh, and by the way, we haven't explored this. We always assumed so far that all the peaks are on a circle so that the given periodicity vector distance there. So we essentially impose a, a, a underlying scale to the problem, but you can have multiple scales in this by uh, assigning peaks at different lengths, at different distances from the center. And, uh, and so the first question is, what if we make a composite according to these geometries? And uh, we started looking at some of the mechanical properties of, of these. And, uh, and for instance, this is uh, how we treated the problem. So we assume that you have a bimaterial system where the white is one material. And the second material is a material that has a, a, a contrast to it that we arbitrarily put 10 times. Um, so these are um, conceptual designs, but uh, we try to normalize everything so that we can then make some fairly general conclusions in terms of, um, of what these mechanical properties are. And so we assume that these are basically two material composites with in-plane strain conditions. And uh, we started looking at what happens to the stiffness properties of these, equivalent stiffness properties, as a function of the symmetry order and then as a function of the Philip fraction. So we can define how much of material A or the white material, the black material we have, depending on where we put the threshold in our distribution. So we can make it all white and then transition to all black and all grades in between. And then that defines a filling fraction uh, parameter that we've studied these in, in terms of. So the first step is uh, we, we started looking at the equivalent properties and we, we used an approach based on these uh, reference here where we look at um, a notional RVE problem. So we, 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 we selected a, a representative volume element that is, was considered large enough. We did a number of studies to look at um, how many, how big of a, a domain we needed. And then we apply um, basically strains to the, at the boundaries. And we discretize this using a finite element tool in console and we did a very fine discretization of these domains and then we looked at how they deform under these applied um, displacement fields at the boundaries that induce axial strain in the two directions a and b as you see here and then shear and so again fairly standard approach to come up with um, the boundary so we can get the strains associated with with the applied uh, displacement uh, fields here and then um, and then from, from there, we can take the average stresses that are uh, just inside the boundary here. And then uh, having stresses and strain, we can basically invert the stiffness tensor and get the equivalent stiffnesses in, in the problem. Again, it's all plain strain conditions. So we have only three components here. And so we can estimate the Poisson's ratios and the, um, the Young's moduli uh, and the elasticity, modulus of elasticity which we can then convert into Young's modulus and shear moduli in, in, in this plain strain conditions. So, um, so what a, just to walk through some of the results that we've obtained. So we can start with the fourfold symmetric, which is the square lattice. And uh, the square lattice is a good reference because it's periodic, first of all. And, and so we know a lot about it. And uh, I think it's always a good reference to look at because um, we we know that um, it has good strength capabilities along the main directions of the lattice vector, but um, it it does not do very well uh, along a 45 degree line. And because it becomes an isotropic pretty quickly, depending on the on the filling fraction. And in the static sense, um, that is certainly true. But it's also very true in the dynamic sense. So if you look at the wave motion across these lattices, you can see that there's strong preferential directions of wave motion pretty early on, a pretty uh, early on in the frequency domain, I would say. So if we look at, um, you see at a 50% filling fraction, you can see how the Young's modulus becomes preferentially high along the lattice vector, so in the x, y direction, but then it becomes 
weak in the other direction. So, uh, and then obviously, as you go to the 70% case, then you, you're we're converging back to the, say, all black phase. So you, you start to get uh, gain anisotropy again. But the whole idea is that if you want to mix two materials according to a square lattice arrangement, you have to deal with uh, the onset of uh, non-isotropy or lack of isotropy of the system, which may be a problem in some cases. And uh, so we compare what we get in this case for uh, against the um, the rule of mixture bounds that um, you can look at. and so you can have the you look at the upper bound based on Boyd um, limits and then on Royce bounds. And so we falling right in between um, as we expect based on the rule of mixture and homogenization case. So this is for the uh, fourfold symmetric ones. If you look at the um, tenfold case, for instance, just as an example, it's interesting that with the same volume fraction, you have very, very, uh, you maintain a good, good isotropy for the system. And uh, I think this is consistent with other fundings that have looked at isotropy in quasi-crystalline type systems that they can maintain this level of isotropy without reducing too much on the uh, Young's modulus performance overall by looking at the mixture of two materials. And, and so this scales quite well. Um, if we look at, again, how it compares, there's not a big change compared to, to the um, square lattice, but again, that's what the, the main difference is the, the directional dependence, which is much less sensitive. And uh, so if we do a comparison across multiple designs, you can see, again, this is um, pain across the, the eightfold, tenfold, and 14-fold. All of these are the 30%, 50%, and 70% on the curves define the, uh, uh, the filling fraction for, for all of these. And so you can study. So I would say, Generally speaking, my, my conclusion is this. These are interesting for one specific reason. I don't know that they're particularly superior in any way, but I think the whole idea is that you can look at these geometries in addition to what we uh, people typically look at um, with looking at fourfold or sixfold symmetries, again, uh, which have potentially some advantages to these. Um, the... <clears throat> If you compare through them, as I mentioned, there's not a lot of a change in terms of uh, the various uh, properties in terms of Young's modulus and Schill modulus. What's more interesting to observe is the Poisson's ratio. They are quite different. They don't vary over a very broad range, but they they change. Uh, you can see some 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 differences there in the Poisson's ratio across these, which is shown here. And uh, I think the main main difference is in the anisotropy or isotropy which we estimated or evaluated using the Zener anisotropy ratio, which is defined here, is just a, a ratio of these properties. And you can see that there's a clear distinction within um, the fourfold that has a strong anisotropy and a peak um, around 50% volume fraction. So, um, so this is a kind of a, our first overview on these uh, designs. We, we haven't built them, but um, we may look at them later on. And, and we've looked at all of the dynamics. And, uh, and so we started looking at wave propagation and the band gaps. Um, so the dynamics is, is a good way for us to estimate um, how are the properties that we've obtained, how good are they in the long wavelength, sort of a, some sort of wavelength, wavelength regime, and, uh, and how um, they behave dynamically. And so in this case, um, so if we, we, if we take the fourfold symmetric one, then we can uh, do a tra traditional or sort of standard block analysis and, and plot a band diagram for them. And so we can look at the P wave and S wave um, modes in the long wavelength limit. And just to give a reference, because um, to give a reference of where we are in, in our studies. So we're looking at the long wavelength if we make reference to the fourfold symmetric. And so we look at these uh, normalized frequency, which is basically frequency normalized to the um, longitudinal wave speed uh, for a, a square lattice design. So we are in these regimes where we have the two modes. And then uh, what we have done is we looked at the two modes separately and we decompose them by taking the, the, the Hummel's decompositions of the field so we can separate the two and, and visualize them. 
And so you could see um, the uh, the P mode, and uh, and we can do the Fourier transform of this and uh, and observe where the uh, isofrequency lines uh, fall over the um, the block diagram predictions, which are the the white line. And if we look at the shear mode, then uh, it's a little bit more complicated. And uh, again, it's separated by taking the Helmholtz decomposition of the results, and then you can see uh, where it falls. And obviously, the shear mode is always a little bit harder to excite uniformly in all directions. So you, that's why you can see these spots uh, on this on on these uh, 3D FFT that are not uh, fully going around uh, uniformly, as in the P mode. So. In the in the case of the uh, non-periodic composites, so we have to we don't we cannot apply Bloch's theorem unless we de define some sort of a again very large um, domain and we assume that there's periodicity beyond that. We haven't done it. Um, we're not sure it's. We try to do it. We're not sure we get much information out of it, but. Um, we can still do simulations, numerical simulations, and see, and then we can do uh, Fourier transforms in space and time and look at isofrequency contours that result from it. And then we can compare with the um, radial variation of the speeds to see how uh, how they fall. So uh, we can look at the radial variation or directional variation of the, of the P wave velocity and then of the S wave velocity based on C11 and C66 are what are we estimate based on our homogenization approach. And then numerically, we can observe what happens in our wave fields in the in the reciprocal space. And, uh, and the density is a function of the volume fraction that we include. So if you look at the uh, fourfold symmetric, so this is the contours um, of the snapshot. Of the of the wave that we've already looked at, this is the three the FFT at this frequency in space in the kx ky domain, and uh, the circles are the estimation the estimated uh, wave velocity as a function of our effective properties. So they match; they get a good estimate at these low frequency. That's what we would expect if we did our homogenization right. And uh, I'm sure, of course, this will break down as we get close to the. Uh, to the Bragg scattering limits, for instance, um, where we we cannot make the assumption of the long wavelength approximation, and then the sixfold um, is shown here, and uh, and then the eightfold, and uh, and so on. So we can still see that there's um, the isotropy is still very well maintained in in all of these, and and we would expect this. But um, if you look closely at the uh, fourfold, you can see that it's not perfectly circular. It does have a little bit of a oval type shaped to it, and uh, and the S wave propagation is quite a bit more complicated, and the results are, are are a lot more interesting. I think there's a mix here between how well can we excite the S wave mode in in a uniform way, um, but you can see that um, the eightfold, the tenfold, and so on, they reflect the symmetries and the number of of uh, of fold symmetrics that you can have. In the, in the S wave uh, modes quite well. So, so the transit simulation that um, suggests that for increasing frequency, the the um, the quasi crystal retain tend to retain more isotropy. So it, even in the frequency domain is interesting. If you look at the, this case of zero point four, which is again close to where um, the bands. Or the square lattice veer quite a bit off from uh, directionality, um, so we can see how these. Uh, this is quite interesting to observe how the square lattice clearly become strongly directional. So if you look, at it becomes almost like a square, right? So you'd have the group velocity in this case will be perpendicular to these uh, contours here, so it would be strongly. Aligned with both along the x direction and the y direction, you can see that the propagation is is sort of limited along the x and y direction. And this is um, this is one clearly an indication of uh, of these uh, strong or preferential directions of wave motion. And it's also observed in the sixfold where you can start seeing the hexagonal um, the hexagonal symmetry or sixfold symmetry in in the uh, group velocity plots. 
uh, sorry, in the uh, ISO frequency uh, surface shown here. And again, you'll have basically six directions. But if you look at the other ones, uh, the eightfold higher order symmetries, you can see that, yes, you can um, observe uh, more intense propagation along um, some of the directions, like the eightfold or the tenfold is more obvious. But overall, they seem to be quite uh, circular in general. So, um, so there's two two take home here. I think one is that they can maintain sort of a uniform, quasi uniform wave propagation in all directions, and then but but they also highlight some of the of the uh, rotational symmetries that they are characterized by. So. We wanted to look more a little bit about band gaps, and uh, and we switched a way that in which we analyze them. And so, in order to analyze them, and 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 uh, see whether we can highlight the presence of um, interesting spectral features, I would say, we exploited the fact that they are um, rotational symmetric as um, as a function of the symmetry order. So. We basically took a wedge and the radial extent, the angular extent of the wedge is um, is defined by the order n. So if you have n equals four, then you would have a quarter of a circle and so on. And then we impose periodicity condition um, along the sides of the edges, and then we impose, we let free condition. So it's a finite structure in the radial direction and it's periodic in the uh, rotational periodics in the direction. Again, this is a fairly standard approach for rotational periodic uh, structures. There's references that people uh, that we looked at from the 70s and even maybe earlier than that. And so we developed a tool in um, in we we did the analysis in Comsol as well, and and discretized these domain. And uh, and what we did, you can compute the resonant frequency or the eigenstates for the system for different orders of n. Here, um, n varies from minus n, capital N over 2, to n minus 1. The results are actually symmetric because of uh, the, 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 sim, the, the, even, um, the even distribution in our design. So I'm only plotting from 0 to 5 in the tenfold case. So this is a tenfold example. And what we do, do for any order n here, that means a, a given order of relationship from one side of the wedge to the other, we plot the resonant frequencies that we uncover, and we show them on this plot here. Um, this is not particularly revealing. Uh, this seems pretty full overall, so there's not. It's kind of hard to make any conclusions on this. But um, it was interesting to, for us to collapse them all, so make all the the n orders the same on on one plot, and then uh, and then compute the density of states um, in in here. So. We can see how um, how the 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 difference between one frequency and the next over an interval is, and then come up with the density of state uh, metric, which is shown here, and uh, and you can see that things become a little bit more interesting because then we have um, a dark side. It means we have a high modal density basically, and when it gets to the yellow side, it becomes um, low, very low modal density. So even if we have some modes in there. And some eigenstates in these domain, then we have very few of them, so the density is very low. And uh, <clears throat> so this is evidence of a quasi, a quasi gap, basically, or a low mod modal density region. And if you look at the modes, they are quite interesting. So if you look at the mode in a high density state, or you can look at bulk modes. So they're obviously distributed across the the domain, uh, and I'm just plotting the wedge here. There's a number of modes that are we're still investigating that are quite interesting themselves, they are in the bulk, so they're not at the edges at all, but uh, they are localized. So they seem to be uh, localized very clearly in some regions. And then inside um, inside this domain, in, inside this gap, then you have some modes that are clearly localized only at the edges of the domain. And, uh, and that's sort of consistent with the fact that the system may be finite, and so you have uh, non-bulk states um, that occur and their defect modes, you can call them different modes. Uh, but again, this is consistent with the expectations of, of these modes um, sort of being inside of what you may think of as a gap. 
So to verify um, whether we have a gap or not, I think the best way is, well, the probably the simplest way is to use uh, brute force and then run a simulation to, to see what, what the frequency response uh, would be for the system. So we looked at a circular finite domain and then we apply a omnidirectional excitation and then we took an average response um, at the edges. So we went around the edges and took the average of the amplitude of the response and then came up with this um, response function here. And it does clearly sh show there is some interesting behavior that looks like a gap, um, right? Uh, where we estimate a low density of states in the system. And then we have evidence of some um, defect modes, which we tend to lose once we do the average. So you, you cannot, um, you lose all of the defect modes because the average process, but um, but it's uh, interesting to observe that the gap seems to exist and seems to be measurable uh, quite clearly in these domains. So the density of states as plotted can show us these, uh, these interesting behaviors um, and the fact that these systems, although they're non-periodic, they have, um, they're characterized by, by a gap. Um, and potentially another one. So there's, you can see here that there may be um, another one next to it. So, so we looked more about what's going on in the gap and, and looking at these modes. And so it's kind of interesting to see what happens as a function of the, uh, of the volume fraction. So as you change the volume fraction, we stacked up the, um, the density of states along one line. So they're all collapsed. And again, the yellow shows low density and the dark ones show high density. So the yellow, closer to the yellow, you might be, you have some uh, um, uh, gap and localized mode. So these are some snapshots of these modes that are occurring here where you have one is localized at the edge and then some of them are localized in some of the little islands that you may um, uncover. They show up in, in here and they're consistently in these gaps. So. It, it's interesting that there's some sort of a gap forming at a certain for a certain range of uh, volume fractions and and then we did this and we also computed the response of the system for a huge number of uh, value of volume fractions so we we, we did this uh, in parametric study if you will well where we this is the frequency response function so in the yellow you see the peaks the resonant peaks of the system or when it's finite that um, should match in general, some of the modes, this is a, a more smaller system that we looked at as compared to the ones that we looked for the spectral analysis. So you have maybe a lower model density. So the yellow is a high amplitude. And then you can see that there's a region of blue that is a low response, um, low response region. And, and in this response region, we track the frequency response, the operational response at those frequencies. So these are sort of force response. And you can see that's very consistent with a gap as C2 here shown, uh, where the excitation remains um, confined to the middle where, where it is. It doesn't propagate to the ends. And, and this is a whole blue region. So you have an effect of um, volume fraction seems to be, obviously, as you would expect, to the limit, uh, volume fraction zero, it's a homogeneous medium. So there's not really interesting features to be expected. But then there's a range of volume fractions that show that there's a clear gap in the system and uh, and uh, and if you look at the six-fold symmetric one um, same you have uh, a number of gaps this is what we could um, explore also using block di block uh, uh, block theorem I think we've done it here but I don't report it in this particular case but um, you can see again the volume fraction it's highly nonlinear highly complicated there's no really a, a linear correlation between the volume fraction and where the gaps fall uh, but you can see some very interesting modes that are strongly directional on the six modes that we picked out just to show. And then A2 is a clear mode inside the gap, which is um, quite um, quite interesting. And uh, again, we can we've done explorations for other orders of uh, of the system, and and we show um, similar behaviors, um, although quantitatively different, but similar behavior where these are. Systems are are characterized by by gaps, and they could be good designs for uh, designing some sort of uh, vibration uh, isolating structure that has um, really omnidirectional uh, gaps in certain frequency. You could optimize the volume fraction, for instance, and and so on. Um, so more of these results, nothing different. 
just uh, different quantitative analysis. I think the, the the main message here is that we could use these uh, number of symmetries here to to affect where these may be as a design parameter. So. In the last part, I, I wanted to show we, we wanted to build them, but um, making 2D materials like this, we didn't. I'm sure there's a good way to do it, but we find a better way to do it. This that would be fairly easy to make would be to make stubs and grow stubs on on plate substrates. And uh, 3D printing makes this extremely easy to do. And obviously, I think all of the studies and the computations we've done uh, no longer apply in some ways because we have a plate system here. Um, with stubs growing over them, so we, we're investigating them. But I just want to share some of the results we've had in these directions, and uh, and these are uh, some of the plates that we we built. You recognize the geometry, so basically we have a plate structure underneath, and uh, and then we grow these stubs according to to these designs, and um, and we started exploring them. These are about I don't know thirty maybe 30 centimeter or 40 centimeter by 40. So they're fairly large um, designs. But I, again, we have um, we have a number of them that we haven't tested, but here I'm showing eight and 10 folds. So these are, as I said, very easy to build. Not as easy to analyze, I should say, but uh, we're getting there. And, um, but experiment is quite, uh, quite convenient. So uh, we, we take them uh, with a laser vibrometer so we can get a full field uh, capture of the wave. We excite them with a piezoelectric patch in the middle, and that applies a shear excitation. And so this, these, uh, and we can the response, dynamic response over a frequency range in the back. So we can then take different averages. So for example, we can do sort of a similar study with, that we did in our 2D systems where we take an average along a circumferential direction here are the pink points which we average to look at the response or we can take an average across all of the points that we measured and, and we overlay them so we see clearly again um, the presence of a, of a gap that it's clearly present here um, which is in this particular frequency range so it's relatively high frequency range but I think it's consistent with maybe what you would get with a, a Bragg scattering type um, design I would say and um, and uh, potentially the presence of another one um, uh, towards higher frequency. So we have evidence that uh, we can maybe look at gaps of these. Uh, more interestingly, it's interesting. We, we want to see if we confirm them. So we are undertaking a fairly intensive computational task of um, modeling them using finite element approach to see whether we can have more some predictive capabilities for these and then uh, try to use them maybe for equivalent properties in uh, in the bending. So obviously these are again plate type mode. They're most they're out of plane modes. Um, they're not in plane motion that we're detecting here. So again, the mechanics model that we would apply would be different than the one we used for the 2D composites. And uh, so these are some initial numerical results that we've obtained as early as last week. So um, we took the material properties out of the manufacturer for the um, that we use to build uh, uh, to manufabricate the plate. We we use a uh, external manufacturer. We send the design and they build it for us, which is um, convenient. But we are we have some uncertainty on the material properties that come out. So, but um, it's interesting to show that um, the numerics kind of sort of confirm the presence of the gap. They're not quite where we measured them to be, but. Um, it's it's good enough to at least uh, show them as a as an initial preliminary comparison of results. Um, from the wave point of view, it's also interesting to observe the wave field that we record. This is an eightfold, uh, sorry, tenfold plate, and uh, and this is the wave field recorded from the plate. And and as you will see, you can see um, at some point you will be able to see the tenfold symmetry that comes out as clearly tenfold spots. That occur. So the, the, the symmetry of the design does uh, appear quite clearly in the in the uh, wave field data as recorded. The transient wave field data. This is at a particular frequency when with input center at 30 kilohertz. I think it's a three or four cycle input. So it's relatively not narrow band, but not too broadband, too uh, narrow band. 
And if you look at the KX, KY, so we take the wave field and do wave number, the analysis in the wave number domain and receive from space through and Fourier transform, then you can see these tenfold peaks appearing. And uh, it's also interesting to show that it's still, as indicated earlier, there's still some sort of uh, omnidirectional anis anisotropy. And if we take a snapshot of the time response and and uh, 3D FFT at selected frequencies, you can see that again, these uh, there are some frequencies at which these tenfold appears more predominantly than others. And uh, that's something we're investigating um, because it's just an interesting effect to see maybe maybe where there's un some underlying topology in the dispersion that we should be looking at um, that uh, it could be quite interesting. So in summary, I think this is a good time for me to wrap it up. And uh, <clears throat> I just want to um, summarize what I've presented, which is, I would say, a work in progress in, in, in two parallel but related directions where we have looked at um, theoretical studies on quasi-crystal composites that can be and we we've, we've adopted a convenient design in reciprocal space. I think it gives us a lot of flexibility to come up with new geometries. There are other methods, obviously, um, that design it using uh, projections and, and reflections and so on. So um, I think those are very good methods as well. But um, ours is a good alternative. I think it, it's very very easy to to streamline it. And uh, we've observed some. Uh, interesting behavior in terms of isotropy in the stiffness properties and wave propagation for the higher order symmetries, which are not surprising, by the way, but um, I think they're good to observe. And then we've also observed some band gaps uh, in both the 2D composites and the plates. We show that although they're not periodic or they don't have translational symmetry, they do have long range order, though, and they have uh, rotational um, symmetries, but they have these gaps that could be interesting for, for design applications. In addition, they have a very rich model behavior with localized modes that are internal to the system at the edges. And so there may be very um, inter interesting topological considerations to make as we analyze some sort of uh, the spectral properties of these systems. So in conclusions, I, I wanna thank you all. This is a uh, boulder. I hope that at some point we'll be able to host uh, this group there and uh, this was last week we had the early snowfall and uh, I want to recognize uh, Danilo who's done a lot of this work specifically in the first part and Mateus who's done a lot of work on the experimental uh, studies on the plates and then Carlos who's uh, my colleague at um, in Sao Paulo so thank you very much for the attention and happy to take any questions thank you very much for, the, for this nice talk and uh, so now we are we can take some questions from the audience like uh, usually you can either raise your hand basically unmute your microphone ask the question or inside yes. of the, on uh, the right you have the